Some say there can be no progress without improvements in infrastructure. Others say large-scale construction projects destroy nature. Well, that's our focus for today. I am Neil Taigwe and I welcome you to the latest edition of Eco at Africa. On today's show, we will be visiting Tunisia, where an invasion of jellyfish is causing problems for the fishermen and tourists. We meet a Kenyan environmental pioneer who is doing her bit for our planet and her country. And then we visit a German high-tech company that is exploring the energy potential of algae. Welcome. We begin here in Nigeria, a 260 kilometer superhighway connecting a new deep sea port at Bakasi in the southern part of the country was meant to be a flagship project for the governor of Cross River State. However, some villagers and non-governmental organizations are complaining that the construction will have a devastating impact on the Ikori forest and its communities. After some protests, the federal government advised the state governor to put the project on hold. Pius Olori learned to hunt with his father in the rainforest. He goes hunting two or three times each week. Each wild boar he bags will earn him around 80,000 naira, or 30 euros at market. But today, he's going home empty-handed. We feel the forest for now is our helper because we take good things from here in order to train our children to go to school. Olori calls the Ikuri rainforest home. The forests in southeast Nigeria are some of the most diverse in the world. Over 1,500 known plant species are native to the region, and 77 of them are endangered. As is much of the forest fauna, like the drill. This natural paradise is in danger. Local chief Edwin Ogre shows us where they've already started logging. This is where the government hopes to build its new superhighway, a modern six-lane road. The product's price tag comes in at around 80 million naira, or around 4 billion euros. Ogar suspects that the local governor isn't only interested in developing the area's infrastructure. So he's using uh, the road as a leverage to do logging, logging of the forest around. That is why he has refused to reroute the route away from the forest so that he can have access to the rich forest of, you know, community forest. While the chief inspects the damages, he's approached by Josephine Ote. This used to be where her small tapioca garden was, but now little remains. Ote is a widow and the only breadwinner for her children. This garden used to be her main source of income, but the bulldozers made no exceptions. I begged them to listen, but they only said, sorry, these are the government's orders. Before the governor's bulldozers started rolling, he annexed the land with little regard for due process. Local authorities and residents had no say in the matter. But the annexation plan goes far beyond the 260 kilometers of the superhighway. It stretches 10 kilometers on both sides of the road, taking up a fourth of the entire state. People in Urkuri are ready to fight for their forest. Chief Edwin Ogar has called the community together, including hunter Pius Olori. Together they are planning a protest. They're incensed over the governor's decision to start logging without waiting for the required environmental impact assessment. The governor didn't even inform residents of the plans. They read about it in a local newspaper. If you want to do a super highway, you need to consult the people. And he didn't do that. Rather, he decided to revoke our land using government instruments, to take all our land, and without any explanation. Not even he say he's taking the 
four kilometers for a super highway. I wonder what kind of a super highway that would take that kind of weight. I've never seen it anywhere in the world. Commissioner of Information, Rosemary Archibong admits there are plans to displace farmers and that logging operations have already started without waiting for the Environmental Assessment, or EIA for short. While processing the EIA, let's not sit down. Before the rains, the rain we have here is torrential. Before the rain comes and then we have the EIA you know, certified or issued, then we start clearing. All that has been done is just mapping out the area and trying to prepare the land, clearing, not constructing. The citizens of Yukuri want to use the opportunity to make their voices heard. They'll continue their fight against the superhighway. They hope authorities will listen and repair the existing roads, instead of spending billions on a new highway that could destroy the region's last rainforest. We move from Nigeria to the far north of the continent, to Tunisia, that is awash with bio-invaders. They sound like an army, and for some native species, that's exactly how they feel. The fact is, indigenous flora and fauna can easily be pushed to the brink by the arrival of non-native species that knock the ecosystem out of sync. In Tunisia, an influx of jellyfish is causing problems for the fishermen and tourists alike. The scientists are doing what they can to keep them at bay, but in the meantime, it's a matter of making the most of a tricky situation. These are uncharted waters for the white-spotted jellyfish. It's ended up in the Mediterranean Sea after coming all the way from Australia. The arrival of new species has left scientists in Tunisia worried. Each week, they head out to sea to carry out tests. In 2012, they found this jellyfish in the Mediterranean Sea for the first time. We assume they arrived here on big merchant ships. When ships arrive at the harbor, they exchange their container vessel ballast. That means they release water into the sea from other regions of the world. That introduces fish and jellyfish species that aren't native to the Mediterranean Sea. In the northern city of Bizert, scientists at the university are researching the diets of the new jellyfish species. They've ascertained that the animals do present a danger to the ecosystem. Many jellyfish are carnivorous and many eat plankton. But sardines, anchovies, and young fish also need plankton. As a result, the jellyfish are competing with the other animals and organisms in the sea. These fishermen are also concerned. They still employ traditional fishing techniques. Rather than going out in boats, they stay on shore and cast huge nets into the ocean. Today is a good day. They've caught more regular fish than jellyfish. Scientists work together with the fishermen and their families. In the last three years, there's been an enormous influx of new species of jellyfish. And they're breeding fast. If we end up with this many jellyfish in our nets, we have to shake everything out in order for there to be any fish left over. Close to the capital, Tunis, the scientists and fishermen are trying to catch the offending jellyfish. But with more and more jellyfish in these waters, is the answer to just get used to them? The solution is either to reduce the fish catch or to assign a value to the jellyfish. That's why we founded a laboratory where we can extract collagen from them. Jellyfish can in fact be used to produce collagen as an ingredient in commercial cosmetics. 
This practice is common all over the world, and demand is rising. But the jellyfish are causing big problems in another sector, tourism. Thousands of people vacation on Tunisia's beaches each year, and they don't want to be stung by jellyfish. The jellyfish scourge is leaving many visitors unhappy. When we just started, you know, swimming, and my son got bitten, as you see, with the jellyfish in his stomach. Somewhere in the deep end. Yeah, and he saw like a couple of them as well. Yeah. And my daughter got bitten as well. Which finger was it? This one this or that? One. This one here. Yeah. yeah. But now it's better. Yeah. So it's really, really stressful, really, to be honest with you. In response, the scientists have set up a series of nets along the beach. The aim is to keep the jellyfish away from swimming areas. They wait until sundown to cast their nets, when most of the tourists have returned to their hotels. They want visitors to return here, and not to bring home stories of being stung by jellyfish. Scientists cannot predict whether the jellyfish population will continue to increase but they're already speculating about what the future could hold. We're concerned about the future. We're already beginning to see the effect of this scourge, and we're wondering whether what we're doing is enough, and whether the ecosystem will find a way of recovering. But that's all written in the stars. The white spotted jellyfish can grow up to 70 centimeters long, has eight arms, and only lives for a few months. And it's already getting used to the colder water in this part of the world. Preserving nature has become one of the life works of Lorna Ruto. She runs a recycling business in Nairobi and lives by the motto, turn old into new by doing her bit in Kenya. She was recently named one of the most renowned environment pioneers in Africa. We use plastic for our shopping bags, packaging, and even in our cosmetics. And it's causing huge problems for the environment. Plastic ends up in landfill and in our oceans, but takes centuries to decompose. Production of plastic rocketed to around 311 million metric tons in 2014. Lorna Ruto set up EcoPost to recycle Kenya's plastic. So far, they've recycled around 1,000 metric tons. They turn it into eco-friendly posts. are then able to use these plastic posts to protect their land, rather than cutting down trees for the traditional wooden ones. We like that. Are you also doing your bit? Tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. A German company that specializes in microalgae. These plant-like organisms are fascinating life forms that photosynthesize underwater. Peter Ripplinger is working on how to use algae for sustainable energy production. Take a look at this microscopic multi-talent. Algae reproduce extremely rapidly forming a somewhat viscous mass. They feed on light and carbon dioxide. Bred in reactors, they produce valuable oils and vitamins. The southern German company Subitech makes and sells the reactors. Subitech is a spin-off from the German research organization, the Fraunhofer Institute. It sells the plastic reactors to industry and research institutes. Peter Ripplinger is Subitech's business manager. 
The reactor is a photobioreactor. The decisive factor is to provide the algae with light. We do that by feeding air through the floor of the reactor. The air rises and churns the fluid and that ensures maximum exposure to light. You need a microscope to see the one-celled organisms. Algae's advantage over other crops is that they grow faster and produce more valuable materials. Subitec's client firms can use algae grown in the bioreactors to produce food supplement tablets like these. They provide people or livestock with nutrients when they don't get adequate amounts in their food. Protein to build muscles, omega-3 fatty acids for healthy blood, or red pigment for the immune system. This astaxanthine is sold as a nutritional supplement in pills. As an antioxidant, it prevents damage to body cells. It's also anti-carcinogenic. That means it helps prevent cancer. This substance is currently the most lucrative product from microalgae. Peter Ripplinger has sold several bioreactors throughout Europe. One is now at the Fraunhofer Institute in Leuna, the chemical industry site in the state of Saxony-Anhalt. The scientists here have many more plans for bioreactors. Along with food supplements, they want to develop biofuels for cars. Our biorefinery project aims not only to process the biomass we generate into biofuel, but also to extract valuable materials from the biomass beforehand. Algae fuel at the pump? That's what Subitec is working on. It also envisions algae waste products as raw material for biogas generators. The researchers think bioreactors could be the high-tech power plants of the future. But we are years away from that. For now, algae delivers nutrients, but growing it sequesters carbon dioxide. So one day it could be an ecological fuel for cars or provide green electricity. We go out to Europe where solar paneling is becoming an added feature in the streets in Netherlands. Bike parts are harnessing the power of the sun and the aim is to use existing surfaces such as roads, parking lots or even industrial grounds to generate electricity. To some it might seem like science fiction, but for the innovators of the project Solar Road, this is a vision for the near future. It might look like just any other bike path. But under this cycle lane in Cromany is something a little bit different. It's the world's first road to have solar cells underneath. Innovators like Stendevit at the Solar Road project in the Netherlands are working to make roads to produce energy from the sun. We have more road surface in the Netherlands than we have rooftop area. So if we are successful in integrating PV, solar technology, into roads, then we make a huge extra potential for the generation of solar electricity without using any extra space, without disturbing the environment, but simply in the roads that we already build and use. The path is 70 metres long and took more than two years for scientists to develop. The road surface is made up of three layers, a concrete layer, the solar cells and a top layer of tempered glass. Sunlight that falls on the path's surface is absorbed by the solar cells and turned into electricity. Just metres away from the path is the smart box. Here David can see how much energy the solar cells are generating. Since it was built in 2014, the surface has produced around 10 kilowatt hours, enough electricity for three Dutch households annually. In the future, we want to make a better connection between where the electricity is produced and where the electricity is used, because roads always go through or connect built environment where a lot of energy is used, and we want to make a good use of the decentral character. And perhaps in the future, 
even cars that drive over the roads or bikes that go over the road can be charged from the road. But to use solar cells on a normal road, the surface will have to be able to withstand much heavier weights than just bicycles and scooters. It's here at the TNO laboratory in Delft, more than 70 kilometers south of Krummeny, where problems like this are being worked on. Lead engineer Stan de Klerks and his team are testing the road surface to try to see what could work better in the future. One of the main challenges we had to face was that, um, that we had to create a layer which, is, which you can drive on safely, so it gives friction to your tyre, um, but also leaves as much light uh, through as possible. So you need to create something which is transparent, is robust, uh, and has this friction. Um, and that was one of the main problems we were facing in developing the solar road. As well as testing the road's resistance, scientists also want to make sure light is not lost because of the flat surface, which is less efficient than an angled solar panel. They also want to make sure the cells can stand the heavy weight of trucks and cars. The solar cell itself is very brittle, so it might break very easily. So you want to know what happens if, if you drive over it not 10 times or 100 times, but maybe a million times or 10 million times. The aim is to pilot an improved version of the system with a normal road in two years' time. A solar road network for the Netherlands and beyond. The innovators hope it will be a local solution for using the power of the sun. For another intriguing example of how solar energy can secure our future, we go to Mali, where schools draw their electricity from the force of the sun. Our eco-hero, Makan Tandina, is an electrical engineer from the capital, Bamako. He has been building his solar business for years. Now he is trying to extend the renewable source of power to the inner corners of his country. Dusk in the village of Farako. School ended many hours ago, but the children don't want to go home. This is where they can comfortably get their homework done in the evening. The village doesn't have any electricity, but the school now has these lights. They were installed here just recently. We are very happy that we have lights now. We can study here. And after dinner, we can come back here to play. <laughs> the energy for the school comes from solar power. Engineer Makan Tandina is responsible for the project. After studying in France, he decided to bring his expertise back home. He could have taken his career a long way in Europe, but he's happy to be back in Mali. This is my baby. Even if I didn't finance it, it's my baby. I'm so excited that this project succeeded and that I was involved from the beginning to the end. Every time I see it, I'm really happy. I feel my time on this earth was worthwhile. Makan has to regularly check the system to ensure that it works properly. His first major contract came from the local municipality. This school has a small solar power substation that keeps the lights on. The energy from the sun is stored in these batteries. It's a huge advance for the poverty-stricken village. After making sure everything is in order, Tandina heads back to the capital, Bamako. It takes him half a day to get there. Today he's lucky the ferry is fully operational. The day when the solar power plant was delivered was a different matter. The last time we came to install the equipment, we had to use canoes and then bring them back. It took us a long time and was really tiring. But that's part of our work. We're rural people and it's not easy to get to the remote villages. Makan comes from Timbuktu in northern Mali. He understands very well potential benefits of the scorching sun. At his office, 
He's always busy talking to suppliers, writing quotes, and discussing his latest projects with business contacts. His phone is never quiet. Energy is life. It's a source of life. It's important, like water or light. Life here in Faraco has drastically changed. The extra study time in the evenings has started to pay off. In their last exams, the students here had the highest grades in the whole community. And that brings us to the end of this Sunfield edition of Ecode Africa. If you would like to know more about our show, follow us on our social media platforms and join in our environmental conversations and debates. We will be back next week with more, but until then, tell us what you're doing to protect your own side of the environment. What you, your family, your friends and your neighbors are doing. Use our website and our email address is showing on your screen. Till next week, bye bye.